which is a sequence that dealt with all kinds of things, but they're all buildings. Those are the ones and the big ones that were in the, the apparatus that didn't work. So it did. So I had to do as it was, I had to improvise the same story on the pots instead of buildings. You know. And it worked all right, but it's still still more difficult. I didn't want to show the pots, but I was I was forced to. But now I'm going to just show a few buildings. And I'm not going to show the buildings just as buildings, because that takes too long, it's boring anyway. But I'm going to do each building, the few buildings I've, I've chosen, about three or four. I'm just going to say a single thing. So this one is not going to be a description of that particular church. It just tries to say in sort of quick words one, one particular thing. I mean, you can say many things about a building, all kinds of things you've tried and you did succeed or not succeed, but there's just one item I want to put forward. There's a Catholic church in The Hague, and this morning you saw a church by an architect called, I mean, I'm using an example, Schwarz, famous Rudolf Schwarz, famous German architect. And if you remember right, you saw a tall white space, remember, with black seats. And there was a flat ceiling, enormous distance between the tops of people's heads and that ceiling. Now that is the kind of emptiness, the kind of spatial emptiness between your head and the ceiling which I tried to avoid. That is to say, that church is too high. And in, me, in my opinion, it's too high. Now, not, not because it, nearly all modern churches in Europe were too high. And they were too high because they weren't high enough. Or they were too high because they weren't constructed properly. A Gothic church is much higher, but not too high. There, the height is constructively the result of an idea. So therefore, the height is there in, incredible. Uh, but here it's just two high walls and a flat ceiling. That is not a constructively sufficient, so there is an emptiness. The result is an emptiness between your head, between people's heads and the ceiling. It's just empty space. But, so when I was asked to be in Catholic church, not a Catholic, I had a lot of experience, of course, seeing churches, as all architects have, and look at many churches, so I did it as a tourist. I said, I'm a tourist. I'm a tourist as far as churches are concerned, an architect tourist. That means I've been seeing age for churches, more than most Catholics have. I go to every church, every country, see what it's like, and leave again. So, I immediately <laughs> said, I mean, yes, you can come in, look, watch, see, you know the drama of spanning the space right, right through all those ages. In fact, the history of architecture, as far as we know, you know the language is partly based, as Robert Schultz this morning said, I have so many churches, because that's where the whole adventure of spanning the space took place, you know, a lot of it. Well, so I immediately said, I'm going to make a church, I'm not going to choose between a tall church, which I can't do, I haven't got the money, it's a very cheap church, very little money for the church, I'm going to make a, I want to make a very tall space, but I haven't got the money. That means that the space must be very narrow, because it can't be higher than 11 meters. That's only 11 meters, that's 35, 30, 40 feet, 35, 35 feet, and I, so therefore, I'll have to make it very narrow. It's three meters, nine feet. Because it's nine feet and articulated vertically, it is therefore a very tall space. It's a relative problem. I also wanted to make, for that reason, I put the people, the actual people, where they sit, is in a space that is only between two meter fifty and three meter fifty high underneath the beam. That's extremely low. Therefore, I was combining, which is the thing I always do. I just can't help it in combining opposites. Making a church that was crypt-like, like the early Christian churches, well, not before that, where the Christians had to creep away because they were in danger, and they crept cozily into cellars, and to, and to, you know, into grottos in order to pray. So the combination of an extremely low space, an extremely high space, that's what you see here. So that is a section, the trusses, a very tall central space, which you walk through. So the central space is a place which you enter the church. You don't actually sit there. And you see all light comes from the top. Enormous drums, two meter high, the light comes right to the top. So there's a kind of illuminated space above the beams. Another mad <coughs> thing about the church is that it's inclined. And for everybody that's interested in axis, this is really something. <laughs> because the axis, the inclination of the church is at a right angle to the axis. 
So you'll see the plan in a minute. Therefore, you see it's not like this. This one now is tilted towards me. Yeah, and if the altar was here, that church is tilted in this way. And the axis is nevertheless there, tilted 90 degrees to the axis in the direction of the, of the terra, which, which creates one side of the church very low and the other high. All right, next please. I'll show you. I got it myself. That is the low space. The low space in the church with the top light. It's a dark photograph, doesn't quite come off, but the contrast is, thank God, not as dramatic as that. It's quite nicely illuminated daylight church. Uh, you have Peter Smithson? We're talking about Peter Smithson somewhere else, you'll see him. And they're all arguing whether the church is okay or not. <laughs> and that's the tall space. You see? The tall space. And the tall space has articulated height. Those drums are enormous, they're three meters the light comes in. And you can see the steps rising up. They rise in five different levels. And the altar is halfway. And it's much faster. There you see you look up and you can't see again. Actually the space beyond the beam. The beam is about 60 centimeters high and then there's a lot of space where the circle is complete. The drum is complete again until you get the cupola right up above. So it's a very large space that's bathed in light. It collects the light and then it transmits it downwards. And the lamps are all just Chinese paper lamps. You see, there's the plan. Not quite. The plan is a tiny plot. Okay. Okay. Well, look, it was a tiny plot of land, that's why the whole thing is based on a rectangle. And uh, you can see the tall space is in the middle here. That's the tall space. Here are the steps. You come in here, up those first two steps, up those steps, and the, the altar is halfway there, and then you move up further. You can also enter here, and you descend. So you can see that in spite of the fact that there's an axis in this direction, the church is tilted 90 degrees to the axis. Now, of course, that's my idea of trying to maintain the axis <coughs> insofar as when you sit, it should be a, a static a static idea, a little priest in the middle. But for, for the whole rest, when you move through the church and enter, because people come in, and they can come in through there, they come in, from the altar side. They don't exit by the back. Anyway, you see also that there are these chapels. There are these chapels. Catholic churches have uh, lots of chapels. They are multi-spatial. That's the thing, not, I'm not Catholic at all. It's what interested me in all the visits of Catholic churches in the South, whether Spain or Mexico, or Italy, Italy, I've seen, is that many things happen at the same time. There could be a mass, there could be a uh, small little something happening there, the lady with the basket praying, or, so, or something, marriage somewhere else. I mean, there are many things happening in many places at the same time, which I thought was interesting and exciting. So that's what I did. These chapels are all turned inwards. So this is kind of narthex. It's narthex where people come in and leave the church again. Through there, and they sit down very cozily, and then the, 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 the baptism and the, all the other altars are turn inwards. Okay. That's just the main idea. And here, I'm just showing you the details during the service. You see, what happens you see, what happens is, the other thing is, the sacristy, you know the sacristy? Well, the sacristy is as far away from the altar as possible. In Holland, you see, they never had any processions. Processions aren't allowed in Holland. And so I said, well, if, I put the, if I put the sacristy very far away from the altar, then at least the, you have an internal procession, either upwards, mounting these steps until you get to the altar there, or you can go the other way and descend. So 
choice. I mean, it's, it's very effective, the atrophy, whether you ascend or descend. And I just left it there. So that is another uh, speciality of this church. Anyway, what I want to show you is the narthex, a kind of narthex that runs through the middle, tilted at 90 degrees to the axis. That's my, that's my game with the axis, because the, the entrance is one meter high. You see, you, you, no, one meter lower. You go down these steps, and then you rise one meter again until you get to the same level. So it's a tilted piece of land. And uh, that's the strange thing about this church. It's tilting in, in, at right angles to the axis. And the altar halfway. Putting the altar halfway, of course, is obvious that in my philosophy I would do so. Even if I'm not interested in what happens to the altar at all, it's a very significant place for other people. And if it's a highly significant place, then I regard it should be halfway. It's halfway as you enter or leave, but it's raised normally as any normal church when you sit there, then it's raised. But as you leave the church, it's halfway. That is a very relative place, and it is sort of somehow mitigating the hierarchy between the priest and uh, the, the layman, which is actually what the people who made the church wanted the market to build it, uh, wanted. Uh, it was not built in the period of this pope, but the previous one, but a lot of people were John XXIII. And during that period, people were rather like. Now I'm going to show you purely why I'm showing you the church at all. It's just to show you the question of the intimacy. The desire of You've got that crypt like space, only two meters, only, only three meters, from two meters to fifty to three meters high where the people sit. And here you have the tall space. And during the service, when the church inaugurated, there were many priests, two bishops. And they had, had, had you see them in your alleyway. You can see them all walking now, in procession, and the people are sitting, you can't see them. And now, you see, there we are. Those are one of the chapels. The chapels facing inwards towards that narthex. There must be some church like this in Armenia somewhere, but I've never seen. According to me, it's my invention. And probably it is. There you see, now you're in the low space. You're in the low space, the tall one is behind the priests there. And now you can see the first sacrament in that church. There's a family there, a father and a mother and a little baby, and they are going to be he's going to be baptized. And why I'm showing you this is just to show what happens. The people sit in this low space, crypt-like, as they did in very early Christian times. And the family moves out into that tall space and then reverses back into the chapel for a moment and something very private happens. That was just, I wanted to do it that way. There they come, you see. They come out of the low church, the priest following the priest, there's father, there's mummy, there's the very child, and whatever. It means a lot to them. It doesn't mean anything to me, but it means a lot to them. It's all right, but you, you, you just try to say, now, wait, what happens? This must be intimate little family thing. And the people in the church wait, don't participate, can't see it, but they wait. That's the way it happens in this church. And you see, now they enter that very tall space, articulated. This is an evening, so no light comes in from the drums. This is at night, so no light comes in through the concrete drums that are nearly two meters fifty high. And the next slide shows you when they all together creep into this sort of small little drum and the baptism takes place. <coughs> so this is a sort of very family affair suddenly. It's a sort of very family affair. I don't know what it all means. I don't know what it means, of course. Certainly. That's their business, not mine. It's my business to try and, try and, try and set the stage so that, so that it works congenially. And then they move back into that low space. So it is a combination of an extremely tall, gothic-like vertical space and a low crypt-like space. That's what I tried to do with that church. Therefore, not trying to choose, to make a false choice between high and low. And I agree with Norberg Schultz in the sense that modern architecture had its strongest point has been lateral continuity. They were very sensitive to space, to a lateral opening up, and they overdid it in a way. But they had very little attention for the articulation, vertical articulation. Vertical articulation, which is something that has something else morphed around it, you know, not for view, of course, for view is marvelous in, in the vertical sense. But for the rest of modern architecture, 
discarded or didn't even have sufficient interest yet. But there's no reason at all. I've never had any anger about that. I just thought, well, that is up to me to start putting the accent on the vertical articulation and not to be angry with those that didn't. They can't do anything at the same time. I can't do it at the same time. People have to take over. You know, if you want to hurry, if you want to get to a good architecture soon, don't be in a hurry. Leave it to the next generation to carry on. But don't start reacting against the, what you regard as being the deficiencies of the previous architecture, or reacting by going backwards. That's ridiculous. Don't carry on. If you don't like it, do better. Next, please. Uh, I'm not sure next people all the time. So again, that sounds still... That's right. Now I'm going to show you it's the reverse anyway. I'm going to show you only one detail of this ancient building, which is the first big one I've made. That was made during the end of CM, exactly in 59. And I'm only showing that for one reason. Just showing the roof. How could you make a flat... How can you make a roof on a building that is so flat, so big and so flat, one floor? It receives rain, has to has to canalize the rain, a lot of rain in Holland. But it also has to have a form, because the, the roof is the biggest facade. The vertical facade is only, is so to speak, only three meters, four meters high, three meters fifty. The horizontal one is the biggest surface of all, so you've got to do, think of that one, and the ceiling is, is, is incredible, complicated. So I'm only showing you the orphanage for just one reason. I mean, I've got many pictures. I'm just going to enter one space, the one that is behind that, under that big cupola there, which is where the children live. I mean, it's not an expose of the, of, of the whole thing. So many ideas in there. So you can see, you enter one of the patios there, into that space that's underneath that cupola. And you enter by that sliding door. And you see the little pools here. I wasn't allowed to make ponds, so we got a piece of wood, hollowed a uh, bulging piece of wood, and asked the people making the concrete at the last moment to sort of turn it around and make some puddles of rain water so we had enough to avoid. But that's a reflection. We like reflection in Holland. Anyway, you enter there, and then I'm going to show you the detail. Ah, yes, this is just to show you exactly that there was glass bricks there, because I don't want the patio to be opened up too much. So this opens out, so it's sort of an enclosure. Next, please. Ah. Yes, that's all right. This one, this is mirrored. Doesn't matter. It's mirrored. Anyway, the doors are on that side. Is it a complete picture, actually? All right. And you see here uh, a symmetrical kitchen. All the elements are symmetrical. <coughs> that is to say, symmetry here offers a solution for a family of forms. All the forms that are concerned with the kitchen, the cupboard, the sink, is all, are all some belong to each other, and they are asymmetrically placed in a symmetrical order. You can see there are three different elements here. Two of them form an opening in the cupola. The cupola is nine by nine, or ten by ten, three thirty three times. So the three times, four times three ar architraves all around. And here is this, the actual, uh, what do you call the, the kitchen element? Well, they don't cook here, they just make tea and hot milk and porridge. And uh, now, I can't show you more, but it's just this, this detail I want to show you. Then you look back. You look back into the space. This is before the children were in the building. There were no toys around or anything. And you can see that there's an article, there's a cupola there. Of course, people ask me, and say, why do you make such a tall playing space for children that are so small? I said, well, if I make a small space, I can't make the smallest small already. If I make a big space, I can tame it and articulate it in such a way that it becomes cozy. If I put a little house inside there, sometimes they're round, or sometimes they're big, children put their dolls to sleep. There's a recessed space in there, which eccentrically reduces the size three times, so there's a reduction in space three times. And then, of course, the big space becomes rather nice. A cupola, of course, has a tyrannical center, and the shifting, uh, uh, the, the decrease of dimension is shifted twice from the center, so I've decentralized it. But I, again, I can't decentralize a building if I don't start centralizing the cupola first, so I accept the tyrannical center, and then I tame it. I don't avoid the center, take the center, but then 
quite softly down. That's what it's for. The centre of mind is the centre of the circle, the hub of the wheel. But don't do that exercise. Make it, but now soften it up by putting the other things eccentrically. <coughs> Well, here is this element. The whole, the whole reason why I'm showing you this big building that has hundreds of details that sort of took years to think up, and I'm just showing you one, because you saw this element standing there in the space. It had to be articulated sharply. Well, how do you do that with no money? Well, that was the first time we introduced these costless little mirrors. You see, those mirrors are an elaboration, but they are necessary because uh, they have had to articulate. And they're obviously active. You can see they're bright, they're bright. And if you shift, they're no longer bright. So therefore, a little mirror like that is very active. It's not a question of reflection or looking at yourself in them. They're very active and they're very cheap. And then, of course, I had, had to make a very thick slab in order to have the mirrors work. But what I'm trying to show you is this. You see, all architects are in love with form. And there's no reason why that should get into any you able to get into conflict with function. So I don't like this use of FFF, form follows function, and function follows form, and go on. <laughs> Everybody has his own silly variation. But form and function mean exactly the same thing. They mean exactly the same thing. They're just sisters. So you don't have to just play around. And if they haven't had both F, if they had been something else like SP, it would be all right. They're F, 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 F all the time. It's nonsense. You see, I love circles and I love drums and cylinders as much as any I can take we're all in love with form, but then don't misuse it. Now here, the kitchens have to be closed kitchens, normal kitchens behind the door. That's what the client asked. But if you have a closed kitchen, it means that the ladies look caring for these ten children who are in this department are always somehow somewhere else. And there's a conflict between what they do in the space in the kitchen and what the children are doing. They can't look after them anyway. They're not with them. So I said, why don't we make an open kitchen? Ah, no. Open kitchen. Ooh, open kitchen. That's all right. But that's dangerous. Ooh, gosh, yes, that's dangerous. Yes, terribly dangerous. Those children are always just quite close to me. Always just there. And sooner or later, boiling water or boiling milk will fall over them. No, no. We don't want the kills to where we're boiling water. I said, I want an open kitchen for other reasons, it's going to be open. We will see to it that nothing happens to the water, you see now. So what did I do? That has beautiful Italian glass, bright blue, fantastic blue, like lapis blue uh, tiles in there, tiny ones, inside. And it has just normal gas thing, has a little gas thing all the way down there, that deep. And the kettle is in there, just a normal kettle. And that big battlement, that huge drum round, it makes it absolutely impossible, I've tried it, makes it impossible for anybody to pull that kettle over, you can't. We've tried, we pull it, it just falls over, push it over, the water falls out. So now you've got a fantastic beauty, not as a <coughs> cinema, but the beauty of the fact that they are right in the middle of the space, steam comes out, and no danger, no somebody running, <gasps> rushing off, putting the kettle off, making some mistake, an accident, never that, because she's so frightened. Nothing happens. The water just boils, hot, lovely milk, no danger. You see, that's the beauty of the circle. Not the concrete that happens to be around like that. Now, that's nice, but it's so nice for me. It's nice because it works. It works. And you can simply utilize. And the, the kitchen sink is also around. Well, all Dutch architects have never seen a round sink except the ships. So they kept the old modern architecture. They came to me and they said, isn't it rather strange, a round sink? I said, well, not all that strange. The children, since the 17th century, they eat out, they eat from square plates. They looked at me. Are you tricking you, fooling us? Yes, they eat from square plates. That's why I made a round sink. So it was very, 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 very jolly difficult to tell my colleagues in the modern sailor movement why I made a round sink. Sinks are always square. Right, square through there. It's ridiculous, isn't it? That's the only reason why I'm showing you the old orphanage. Just to show you one little place where form, all the enjoyment an architect can have with form, all games you can do, circles, cut out, circles, pull up, anything you like. 
but it must have sense. And it can have sense. Put it in the right place, and it, it works. The mirrors have sense, they, they are. Well, that, of course, is extra. The children do like sort of looking at them and discovering, looking at them, they do that, too. But that's not the first thing what they were made for. That's an extra. And they, the nice thing is they look at themselves one after the other. One mirror, and they really, and you don't believe it, but they're different. Every time, if I have nine mirrors in succession, I look at myself nine times in succession, I bet you I see nine different others. <laughs> That's the kind of the multitude of the mirrors. Yes, you believe me, it's the way it is. Okay. And yes, and in that period of time, of course, when nothing in the past was allowed to be was used, I bought four, four Spanish tiles, 17th century tiles in the market. In the market, they said, well, I'm going to use those. And it's a big white wall, big white wall. But since St. Nicholas, you know, that's the, that's the fellow of the Dutch Santa Claus, who brings presents on the 5th of November. And that's the big children's feast. So for the children, I immediately realized that these five tiles you can see the axis is asymmetrical. They weren't the same size. So anyway, that's why I did it, but I like that, you see. Anyway, I didn't cut them off. I could have done. If they had been four, four I don't think I would have done that if they had been four equal size ones, but I was pleased they weren't. Anyway, this wavy form. Uh, but it's a symbol. There you have a symbol, like the one I showed you in Saradan. But this I am sure of myself. I wasn't looking for a symbol. I knew that if the children knew that these tiles are from Spain, they would say, that's where Sunny Claus comes from. And they did. They said, look, Spanish tiles. Sunny Claus in the country. I mean, that's incredible. So they work. So in this particular case, sometimes the symbol still has value. And then you can use them. But otherwise, you can't invent a symbol. Anyway, not those fools. Well, we have to wait for the next drum. Now we've got a few things quickly. I'll be much faster now, but we're going less about it. Just done them. I'll be much faster. The second, <laughs> picture, <laughs> the second picture. Why did it come? How do you make it come? She's changing. What? She's changing the tray now. Because it's slow. <laughs> well, I have to stop, but these are so nice and funny pictures. You haven't seen a building like that before. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Look, those roaches are going to be put on the Those roaches are going to be put on the wall of the church. Translated onto Cuban church. That's the church, the Moroccan church, has shifted axis all the time. There it is. That's looking up towards the sky. You can see all the blue is sky inside and outside. So those walls will be internally lit as they are outside. There it is. They're going to build it soon. I can't show you the shifted axis. The axis shifts all the time. Those are the dormers. The light comes, falls in through the roof onto the walls. And the walls inside will be completely dematerialized through the Malacca motives which come from their ancient culture. The walls outside will be completely dematerialized because there's going to be a trellis work of steel all around with the roses. So there'll be no walls. Inside and outside the walls are completely eliminated. That's getting rid of architecture. <laughs> there you see, like that. Outside, that's the entrance. You'll have to, except for the zinc dorm dormers, all you'll see is roses in summer and foliage in the winter. And that was, has its reasons. It's not because that suddenly become vegetated, but there it is. Here is a building, the ESA, the European Space Agency. This is a huge building existing, and here is a conference center with a restaurant which has been plugged in. That was our idea to give this building a center. Could have been separate, but it's plugged in. There it is. These just little courtyards, <coughs> and I'll show you. There it is, plugged in, you see? <coughs> What's happening? I think I'm going to stop. I'm going to show you just a few more of these, and I'm going to stop. It's a funny building. I want to show you the sections. I'm not sure the sections. Okay. They're not quite focused, are they? 
Well, the roof is going to be copper, and everything you see inside is steel and plywood. White steel, you see? There is the biggest span as it moves all the way down the building. <coughs> yeah. and those columns are 1 meter 90. They're very squat and they're 90, 80 centimeters <coughs> wide. Yes, that's looking towards the ancient building. That geometry there is, of course, what was there. Those are the people eating the tables. Oh well. The next one, same front. That's a kind of a kind of lobster's foot. The tail, lobster tail. There's the building from the front. The restaurant looking back. All steel. That's lower. This is just a little small model. You've got all the details done. You see, here I've taken that central roof off to show you the idea, and that's why I'm showing you this picture. I'm only showing you this for one reason. Oh, you're the man that focuses on me. <laughs> <laughs> you're culprit. <laughs> you see, here I've taken that piece of roof off, and you now see the idea. You see, here you are. I've taken that piece of roof off in order to show you that the angle of these trusses when going over these columns is, 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 a, very, is a particular angle. And at my discovery there, what we discovered there, you can see it there, you see this angle, that one, and that, these are not made of glass, we just use blessed glass in order to construct a tiny model. These are steel trusses. But this angle is such that how to design that big squat column, that's what I want to show you, then I end. You see, it's this angle. But sometimes these columns are have walls or glass walls or glass panels touching them and how to choose the angle now the fun was that the only the columns are composed there they are the columns are composed of x number of cylinder uh, of tubes seven centimeters are steel drums seven seven centimeters and the interesting thing was that the only number that always has a, a, a side on the opposite side of an angle the side of, is, a, is an irregular number, it's an uneven number, 7 or 9 or 11. So the columns are, have, are 11 sided, they're endecagonic. <laughs> and uh, I have called this an endecagonic proposal because the whole idea of the column that has seven sides always means that if I have a wall touching it there, another one there, there are, there are really a countable number of facets, of fa facets, not just a bit of a circle, a segment of a circle left, but there is a countable number. If the wall comes in there, that one comes in there, there's just one. So it's a, an articulated segment, an articulated segment. But I, I like the idea of an endecagonic, and I'm going to leave you here, because, uh, because you see the endecagonic, here it is, the 11th, with cannulas, steel, with tim, uh, <coughs> plywood, plywood cannulas are going to be slotted in, and these two. But the 11, the fact that I found that the 11 was the right number, and I call it endecagonic, because the obvious solution, the obvious solution is, is not always obvious. One tends not to use an 11, an endecagon. And so, uh, help me to, uh, with the, uh, the development of endecagonic architecture. <laughs> Endecagonic architecture means just invention. You've got to invent the right, not steal the right solution from the path. You've got to invent it. And the past will help you. The past will help you. I'm not going to show that. Okay. You saw this. Uh, uh,
at this uh, at this time, as, or you see that it seems um, it seems appropriate in view of the lateness of the hour and the many things that have been said uh, since this morning uh, to ask um, the morning panelists, beginning with uh, Norbert Schultz, to uh, respond to uh, Aldo Van Eyck's uh, commentary. It seemed to me that Aldo Van Eyck did a great deal of responding to the morning uh, <laughs> talks, and so it seems fair now to give the morning people a chance to respond to <laughs> them. <laughs> so, <laughs> we can never get the right technology. <laughs> uh, so therefore, would you begin? Thank you, Sally. I shall try to do that. It is certainly not easy to respond to Aldo. <laughs> and uh, um, I have made some notes, so I must try to put the bits together. Uh, anyhow, I was very fascinated and sometimes even happy to listen to him because he reminded me of my own youth. Uh, he reminded me of the modern movement to which we belonged. And uh, Aldo certainly grew up with the modern movement, and I did to some extent, being a little younger than him, I came into it maybe later and haven't had that deep involvement he has had. But I, though basically, grew up with the same things. I know what he talked about. And I love many of the things he talked about. And I agree with Aldo that the modern movement has been, to a high extent, misunderstood. And that the message hasn't kind of got through. And that what we are criticizing today as modern architecture is the generation of modern architecture uh, so, to a high extent, I can follow Aldo in this. Um, I don't think that uh, his description or definition of the modern movement is somewhat, um, let us say, limited. He has chosen uh, a part of it, and I think he agrees with me in that. He says that modern art wanted to be concrete. And of course we know that certain artists of the modern movement, like for instance Hans Eyck, pronounced that very clearly. I know new art from my time in Zurich, and he was often a guest at Gideon's house. And he said that the work of art should not represent anything, not something else, as you said. I know that. But how then about Brancusi's birds, and which rise so beautifully up in space? How about Paul Clay's poetical statements, which have titles and mean something? So I think that this concrete art is only one side of modern art. Modern art wanted much more. Uh, well, we don't have to discuss that now. I think, though, basically that modern art was a necessary uh, answer to a new open world. And there I agree with you, a dynamic open world where simultaneity, as you said, is a basic concept. The fact that we might be in several places at the same time, so to speak, uh, in the past, you lived in a closed village or farm. Today, we are everywhere. We do not only travel around, but we switch on our television, or we read our newspapers, or with other means of communication. We know everything, or at least much of what goes around in the whole world every day. And in a certain sense, we are in many places simultaneously. And that simultaneity that started, of course, already in the 19th century to some extent. The world opened up, became open and dynamic. We live in a global situation. So therefore, I also agree with Aldo that modern art wanted to be uh, not static and limited, but be both and, so to speak. 
And that is the words used by Robert Venturi, by what did you call him, Bob V. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, when he says both and, he though kind of carries on that idea of, of our time and modern art, that we should not relapse into kind of static situation again. And this, I think, is important to point out, because one of my points this morning was that what happens today is not a break with modern art and the modern movement, but grows out of it. And I refer to Gideon's articles from the 1940s to kind of, not prove, but at least substantiate that. So I think that just to stop with the kind of one side of modern art or at a certain historical moment as I have the feeling although to some extent does I think is not correct I think in your work you go on more than you do in your thinking I think in your thinking you're kind of stopped at a certain moment of this development and to be more precise at the moment where a kind of analytic approach was usual. Because when you describe these wonderful pieces of vernacular art you showed to us from many parts of the world, I think you always approach them in a very analytic, not to say formalistic way, talking about abstract patterns, uh, talking about intervals and numbers and so forth. Very beautiful it was to listen to that. But we didn't really get at these objects as what I call things this morning. Something which was used in a certain context and related to life in a certain way. We, you looked at them in a very analytic Way, in a very abstract way. And I think that is a, not a mistake, because also that is right, but it is not enough. It is not enough to stop with that. We have to go beyond that and instead grasp these things as something more, as something real which constitutes an environment. So I think you here in this thinking represent this kind of analytic, somewhat abstract period uh, of the development, which is not only part of the development of art, but also of science. And this attitude was criticized already in the 1930s by Husserl, the German philosopher, who was later forbidden by the Germans because he was Jewish and had to have his works published in Holland, by the way. Husserl criticized modern science in a book which was partly published in the 1930s and then in complete form in the 50s <coughs> after the war, and which is called the crisis of European science. I don't know why he called it European science. It was science in general. Anyway, his battle cry in that book was to the things themselves. That is away from all these abstractions and back to the things themselves. And he tried to approach that problem by introducing what he called phenomenology, which he had already developed much earlier, certainly. Well, his phenomenology is very difficult to understand but some later writers have done it rather nicely. I would, for instance, point to the French philosopher Bachelard, who has written very imaginative and beautiful books on, on say, things. His book, The Poetics of Space, I think, is a very basic statement which any student of architecture, any architect ought to read where really things become alive in their full meaning, not just as forms, as dots of color, or sense data, but really as something alive related to man's life in space. So I think that we ought to go on beyond this abstract approach of, say, early modernism, and get into a more complete understanding of the environment. And I would call that a phenomenological approach. 
I don't think there is a break here. I think there is a development and a necessary development. And that also goes together with the development in architecture, which then gains a quality which traditional modern architecture lacked. We should not forget the lesson of modern architecture. We should not again make static plans. We should learn from the idea of the free plan and the open form, the collage-like form, say, and so forth. But we should combine that with, though, a definition of elements and units as things, back to the things themselves. And that doesn't mean that they become then, again, fowl or fish. They might be both. That is, of course, true, although that the work of art is always both and. And uh, a work of art might be heavy and light at the same time. It might be even dark and light at the same time. And it can express all these things which are between, and therefore it is art. But that doesn't mean that it is relative or without identity. So I'm not talking about the kind of static, stupid things standing around. I agree with you in that. But I'm not satisfied with abstract patterns. I want real things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, perhaps, Francis, uh, you would like to take your turn to respond, perhaps feeling the poem side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll point out to Mr. Van Dyke that his eyes are located on his front. Uh, his ears are located on the sides. I will build it. And I think, <laughs> I, think that, I think that in the past 30 years, Mr. Van Eyck has celebrated his eyes to the exclusion of his ears, and he's missing what's happening today. <laughs> Well now, Brad, it's waiting. Maybe you want to say what's happening to the case. What's happening to No, I, I think that when... Uh, um, the, the thing that, that struck me as most curious, in fact, is that, is that while you indeed celebrate one particular moment, uh, which I would put it somewhere between 1910 and 1920, and then have apparently rejected everything that's happened since, yet when you showed that very last project, uh, there, there were those short, fat columns, which we have seen so much of coming from New Jersey and coming from Philadelphia. And so I think to myself that maybe, after all, you really are a part of the same uh, world of objects that we're all trying to make today. So in uh, that, I see a connection. You must be to carry out and tell me where the squat columns are the 1 meter 90, and they have all kinds of reasons why they're that, mm -hmm. stability. What they have to do with Philadelphia, that's a mystery to me. They probably are right, but they have to explain. Oh, well, there's one very, very short fat one which uh, Bob Venturi did in Oberlin, which you surely have seen. They made a cardboard, isn't it? I'm sorry? They made a plywood. No. For the column. Well, I thought you also made a plywood, too. You said plywood and steel. Ah, but what, what carries the load is steel. I suspect no, that what carries the load in Mr. Venturi's well, column is steel. steel. And what in between the canopy was, I made a thin plywood bent and clicked in between that just because like, but I don't see, you see. Because I think that's a similarity between your work and his. A similarity between, yeah, the similarity <laughs> between, between any, any round form and any other round form. But it doesn't mean that the column is like that because those columns I never saw them. I don't, I don't work that way. I don't, I don't interest in what things you look like. You just told me what they were made of. Surely you've seen them. You know, the plan, the you know, the one that has a voluta, right? Yeah, but I mean, that, those ones, I don't know what you're trying to suggest. Well, everything. <laughs> 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 well, I'll, I'll, I'll add the volutes. I'll add the volutes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Well, those, those columns, the, the reason why those columns are squat is in the first place, of course, because standing next to the you, I really want to go. I mean, they're definitely just put their hand on it. And besides, they, they, they admit uh, hot and cold here, so they actually are fun to do, they do all this stuff. And then trust. 
springs very low, it was high as it can, so to get this, you know, this seven meter uh, steel truss, to start it up high, if I start that truss at three meters and then it goes up to four, there's a little difference between the three and the four. It's the moment it starts at a physical height that it's touched, I can touch here, and then moves up, that, that the increase of height is, is tangible, because there it's really a mountain. I mean, I can't even reach it. And it's because it starts low. That's the only reason. It's the only reason why it's so terribly low. And besides, they've got to be very squat and stable because they've got the side pressure. I mean, I'm very, very, I'm, very, I'm, very, I'm, I'm influenced by so many things, influences. I, when I'm influenced by something, I try to identify myself with it. You know, Reed said that influence is the basis of art. He said, when he was young, I had one dream that was to write a poem that doesn't sound or look like a poem by Shelley, but is it. And it's, that's, my, that's the opposite to imitation. That means I've got to get creep into the soul of this man, which oh, I think is so great. That that's what I want to make. I try to identify myself, and I have no idea of Doika. And the students came along, the friends came along and said, good Lord, that looks like Doika. I said, Jesus, I've succeeded. That's what I <laughs> to try and creep into this man's skin. Now, it's different to saying I've seen some of these sort of columns and I need to do it too. I, might, I don't travel around holidays sort of picking up no, things like that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I said that in the end, we all live in the same world and are the best of us. Except for a few columns. Except for a few columns. These are very good columns. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The columns that the, 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 the Robert S. and Longfellow and, and, and <laughs> make are actually the worst columns. They're, <laughs> they're, they're colonitis. They're some of the colonitis. They've got every virus. <laughs> colonitis. Colonitis is a disease which columns can have when people like these architects deal with them. Colonitis. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Je mag een harde grandmother dat is merk een harde grandmother dat is een kleine harde wat hij is in beeld de cultuur. Hij is een highly emotional intellectual man, het was zo een beetje een tijdje man, maar een highly emotional cultivated emotionally cultivated man. That's why all continents are in his work. They're all there. It's all there. He's conscious of it all. From Greece to China to Africa, he's conscious of it. He's conscious of it. You can feel it in his work. You can feel it in his work. You can't feel that in Nice. You feel it in Corbu. And that's what I call temporal perspective, or temporal death. That's why I think. You talked about Marcuse. Now, Marcuse, of course, is my favorite of all modern artists. You know that. And I don't know what you mean. I mean, the, the, the bird. The bird exemplifies all birds. The fish exemplifies all fish and all oceans. So I don't see I didn't mention him. And what about your object? You see, yes, I have a, I had intentionally an analytical approach to those parts I showed you, and I was intending to. But now that you mention it, it's true. I can't, I do not wish, I do not want to, to uh, pretend the hypocrisy of trying to experience them as parts. I know so much about them that I know that nobody knows exactly what the emotional relationship of the person that used that glass and drank from it or used it in Pueblos is unknown. So the thing there is now no longer a Pueblo pot. It's an object in the Knight's house. Yeah. And if I, I fake agree. that and cheat that, then, I mean, if I haven't just seen it, I've been to the country where I saw the people <coughs> using it and making it, but it's prehistoric. I don't know. So therefore, now it is a different thing. It is no longer a Pueblo pot. I know the Pueblo made it a human being, me, thousands of years ago, but then an Indian made it. I'm conscious of that human, wonderful human fact. Gives me hope. If she can do it, a thousand years ago I can do it again. But I don't experience it as, in that sense, it was a pot. Of course, that was a pot. But because I was talking about the incredible uh, dialectics of the imaginative use of the surface, and what, well, what we can learn from that. I'm giving it a new me. I'm recycling the thing. I'm not trying to use it as a coffee pot again, or as a wine glass. I'm recycling it by using it in my way, in our century. It's still valid. It's still valid. Those pots are still valid. Those Pueblo pots made by people, the Indians, and we use it again. So I don't, I did it intentionally. Yet. It's a language, the whole language of, 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 of not patterns. They weren't patterns. More than pack, but there were elaborations in the surface. And as the symbols, and I said, we don't know about the symbols. There's a wonderful museum in Oaxaca in Mexico, which is Tamayo's museum, which he built for his own collection before he died. And as you enter, it warns you not to try and know anything about what possibly could have been felt by the Tatuco people or whether all the different like that, the collection of Mexico way, not to train over because nobody knows. So that that's then there with the three eyes, the two noses. We do not know. Archaeologists have strange ideas when they see a lady they say it's fertility. When they see something vertical they say it's a phallus, but then archaeologists are not all that intelligent always. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't know that. We don't know why this girl had three no. eyes and two no. noses. We don't know. So all I can say is interpret it beauty I see in it. I'm not trying to be a But let us not talk beyond each other. No, I didn't mean that. I, 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 I didn't mean that we should know how they were used and that we should look at them just in a historical perspective and have to study archaeology oh. to know what they mean. Talk I don't think that at all. That would be, that is usually the ideas of art historians and I might agree that they are not all place that intelligent. But anyway, I would say that it is possible to look at these things and at buildings in a less analytic way. I think that you, in your way of explaining, you might explain it differently another day, or you might have another dimension in your mind. But at least as you explained it today, you belong to that approach which was typical between the wars and which you find, for instance, in Georgie Kepler's books, which is very inspiring and fine, but it is though very limited to looking at, call it patterns in a way, call it elements, call it means of expression, but not really grasping the essence in a way. And when I mentioned it, Brancus, it was exactly what you said, that his bird represents all birds. It, represents birdness, we could say, or fishness. 
And that is, though, what we want to come back to. So I think Brancusi is on the way to figurative art in that sense. And he leaves behind all these just pattern-like abstractions which tended to dominate modern art, unfortunately. The poetry was lost, which Brancusi and Clay and Max Ernst too had. And after the war, it all became art and something else. And I think that was a very unfortunate uh, development, and Gideon saw that too. He was rather desperate about it. But, but you know, I'm a bit surprised that in one part of what you're saying is that I thought that through that particular analysis of saying, look, there are two, there's open space here, this numerical thing I was mentioning, but all the time I was trying to put across the fact that the, 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 the closed center philosophy of European culture, whether it started with Descartes or not, is an exception in the whole culture, entire culture of the world. And is that what I'm trying to say all the time? It's an exception. The open center is that which unites nearly all primitive art, nearly all modern art, actually all pre-speculative thinking. You read Frank Frank, you see that, even the Egyptians. It was at a certain moment it started, the speculative thinking in which things were separated. And the center became a fixed thing. And it's an exception. So I think it's very strange that modern art got over that aberration, that almost mental aberration which has followed Europe as only continents for all those centuries. But not as part of the grandeur of European culture, that is a specific thing, not the strongest point. And other cultures, and especially the so-called archaic and tribal cultures, quite different have been that, that haven't had that. It's an exception. <laughs> and now it's so strange that the postmoderns, in improving, really continuing, would then fall back. That's why I'm so afraid of this philosophy de Mitte, the philosopher of the middle. He's again frightened. Again, the European is frightened of what's the center again, what's its bound. And You're asking us terrible, to, to project a thousand years or so of European culture in favor of primitive cultures about which we know nothing as a basis for our art. We know nothing. Well, you've said that we know nothing about these forms. We can only appreciate them as, as form. And yet, that would be a sufficient basis to say Europe has been wrong for a thousand years. We're wrong right now because we look back to Europe and we should get on with all trying no, to be Indians. Europe, you can go beyond Europe. The, the monde dans un homme. Is, is that, is that the your world conclusion? is a person. No, you asked well, us to reject the center as Europe has made a mistake for a thousand years, which you are by now correcting. By fixing, not reject the center, naming the center, by fixing mm -hmm. the center, the cost of the space around it. That's what I'm saying. It's a, a, a static concept of the center. <laughs> I'm and not sure about the way the, cause, the causal thinking, the co causal thinking is altogether mechanical causal mm -hmm. thinking. Is something that last by, by, by the help of, Eisen, of, uh, of uh, Heisenberg, Bohr, and all the others, all the other artists, was at last we got over that. At last we got over that. For a brief that. moment, which is now past for most of us. And now you've fallen back again. Yes. And you're the only one. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going, you're going back to Africa, and then you're all going back to Africa and trying to create more Christians down there. Oh, no, no, no. I get it. You're going to go to Africa and becoming an African. I'm not an African. I'm not an African. I, I, I picture my Palladio as much as I do an African in the basket. You see, my interest in Africa does not mean I'm not interested in European culture. You Most of my colleagues are not interested in the rest of the world. I'm interested mm -hmm. as much in European art. I've studied it and been busy with it all my life. And actually, actually, you know, yes, there's another thing there about European culture. If you say, for instance, that, that uh, there is something, still something, oh, sorry, just jumping, something missing in art here, and something which we could go beyond, I say that's impossible. It's illogical to say so. There is nothing. What is specific? Then you can say, what? There's something missing in Delacroix. I can tell you what's missing in Delacroix, ladies and gentlemen. There's something specific missing in Delacroix. That is that he doesn't paint like anger. Ah. The greatness of Delacroix is that he doesn't do that. But they're so different. There is nothing conceivable in architecture that we can conceive of that's a statement, not a notion, a statement that can possibly be better. 
in, in, but in I'm not of the best about, of our time. I'm not can't talking about that. better. I'm not talking about better. You I can't just go beyond that. we well, it different things. Yes. All right, right, then we go beyond it in the sense of making it different because we might need that difference. Why do you want to make it different before you've even got near to the human value of what this single architect is showing? I mean, that is a rare example, even Venturi. I call him Venturi now because he also loves uh, Alto. He deserves a call by his name. Otherwise, that's true, yes, certainly. Father, why is it an idiot? Therefore, you're not really an idiot at all, because his house in Chestnut Hill is very really beautiful. Actually, beautiful house. Uh, I like don't, don't mean to rudely break off the discussion, but it is uh, now 20 after 6, and we did say that we would stop at 6, so we, um, we have uh, gone on a little over that. And perhaps, um, we should simply adjourn for now. And at the reception, any of you who wish to uh, to hear more, I'm sure the participants will <laughs> will apply. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we will see you more. Speaking of simultaneity, that is, it yes. also has somewhere the same root as simulation mm -hmm. uh, and simulacra. Oh, yeah. uh, and um, it seems to me that this this wish for or condition of knowing things simultaneously that our urbanization uh, brings about leads us to uh, questions of artificiality right away mm. uh, and to the simulation of other mm. kinds of experience. Uh, and that's a that's a continuing problem. It seems to me that uh, that everyone needs to face in some level. to the question that 
uh, the distinction you were making earlier, Christian, which I hadn't uh, encountered before, of the, the distinction between the public as established institution and the collective as something which was filled with promise. Uh, and I wonder if, if that is something you could extend a little bit more in terms of the, of the discussion of just or some other terms of that. Well, well uh, sorry, one. No, all right. There are so many things coming together here. What we heard before about, uh, say, an acquired meaning, the change of meanings through time and so on, is a very important point, I think. And I think we ought to maybe give, give some more attention to that. Um, and then, of course, the question of what is private, public, etc., is also very important. Well, let's, let's, hold, let's hold that one off. We have another yes. panel discussion, so let's yes. uh, let's stay with the acquired meaning, if that if, if that's something you'd like to pursue. Well, I am not really uh, anything ready to 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 comment on that. I just would say that evidently meanings change, and we know that also from uh, say. Uh, um, history, we know it from the social sciences, etc. We know it from the theory of meaning. But uh, I, though, must say that there are those certain basic structures which seem to remain. And if we now stick with our problems, the problem of place and the structure of place, it seems to me that there are certain basic meanings which remain through changes, but which need to be interpreted over and over again, and given different socially determined interpretations. Um, and I would say then, for instance, the distinction between horizontal and vertical. The fact that human life basically takes place on the horizontal plane. Our actions mean to move forward, first of all, sometimes backwards, but mostly forward on the horizontal plane. And we never <coughs> do that. We cannot fly. So the vertical is another dimension. It has always been the dimension of what is distant or inaccessible. And therefore, I would say that returning to what I've talked about before today, orientation and identification. Orientation is a kind of more everyday problem of getting along on this horizontal plane, finding our way. And that can be done in many ways, but the vertical dimension adds to that what I call character. The way then you stand up on this plane, and the way you fix certain postures through symbols expresses the way of being in space of a certain culture, a certain historical epoch. Uh, you can dress up more splendidly or you can do it more simply and that comes out also in buildings but you stand up in space in that vertical direction and kind of express how you are uh, i think certain structures like that remain as a basis for changing forms and changing ever new interpretations this is maybe not very to the point you made but i think if you start to think in these terms, maybe also the problem of meaning will be more understandable. I, I guess that my comment would have uh, related to that because I would like to find that uh, what the, the uh, person for the comment that the act related to the reality is that a kind of ambiguity of the thing, which I, as I look upon the modern architectural intentions, modern movement, that they intended to make some very clear statement that would come through right away for everyone and they found themselves in a situation that everyone is understood. I find now a reaction to that, which is probably grammar, but I, I would like to also hear a critical present. I see that um, the spirit of place is, is a kind of in-between quality. It's in-between a nature or a reality or an environment and people. There is no spirit of people entering the place and jointly share, which I would like to uh, point out as cultural share quality. Now, what I try to give to as a critical presence is that I see that culture is breaking down to 
very, very private meetings, which is not jointly shared, which um, and we point to this ambiguity that private and public, the joining the share, um, we can approach uh, making place individually, and that may, might be a place for someone. But uh, I think the danger here today is a talk to make uh, also public places, which is a joint thing. There's no <laughs> real privacy without public domain. And when it is breaking down, as I and see that there are so many efforts. Everything can be built. Everything can be uh, possible now. What is where it is shared? How many people share? There must be a kind of in-between, which is an activity problem. That is not just mine. Oh, I belong to, uh, to a coach. So I have to share these values with someone to be able to communicate, not in absolute terms, not in scientific terms, but somewhere where we come to, to uh, <coughs> between an agreement between white and, and, and black. Now, I think this is a, a, a serious danger, uh, which also probably comes from that point that, that life has speeded up so much through the production that we can really get close to think the loss of nearness. We would think that the place, I guess, has to have a certain permanent quality change. Otherwise, we can't multiply or uh, interpret the place in a multiple way, which is the richness of the place, I guess. If, if that's changing so constantly as the production is going ahead, because everything is coming up and images are product, uh, uh, productions now, you can you don't care any longer. <coughs> so I, I certainly would like to hear some of the dangers of this that we are going uh, on to uh, the other extreme. The, uh, 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 unless there's an immediate response to that, I would, uh, I think that touches right on one of the one of the big things I would like to see us uh, continue in, in discussion about, which is this business of agreement, uh, enforced agreement, uh, artificial agreement, uh, or collective possibility, and so the collective uh, uh, presence of private uh, private views. All of that is more than we can take up uh, in the continuation of this panel, I think, especially since the air that we're sharing seems to have almost exhausted itself. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I would suggest that unless there is uh, some pressing uh, 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 response uh, to this set of questions, that we take that as the agenda for uh, tomorrow's discussion added into uh, what we will see in the various presentations. Uh, is there any objection to that uh, pattern?